What's up everybody, this is Perfect Shank, and welcome to another episode of Aquarium Science. In this episode, we are going to discuss zoology, which is the study of the animal kingdom. While zoology is a branch of biology, we will discuss the animals a little bit more in depth than the previous episode, where we actually discuss the ecosystems and the microscopic life of aquariums. You can check out that video by clicking on the annotation in the right hand corner or look in the description for a link. So what can we learn from a zoological point of view for our aquariums? Well, quite a lot actually. If we have to keep animals, it's always best to know exactly how these animals behave and react to different situations. This can be what you feed the animals or what you give the animals for their home. So fish keepers, before you buy any fish, do your research. Let's begin with the main topic. What are aquatic animals? Aquatic animals are a stated an animal that lives its entire life in an aquatic environment. Many theories state that the first animals on this earth have started in the ocean and then us as terrestrial animals have evolved from these aquatic animals. We, as fish keepers, of course keeps fish. So what are fish? Well, fish are what we all would consider as the main part of the ocean. But fish are actually quite advanced animals if we look at some of the anatomy of these different species. The anatomy of a fish looks like this. It of course depends a lot from species to species, where some fish actually has developed different organs or some organs that are the same but work in entirely different ways. What you see here is a perch. So, as you can see, fish have a lot of organs that are pretty similar to the ones we have as humans. In this episode, we're just quickly gonna go over some of the main organs of the fish and how they basically work. One of the organs that a fish has completely uniquely to its own species is the swim bladder. The swim bladder is actually a very simple system, which is just a bladder that fills up with gas to control a fish's buoyancy. And that way, they can stay at different water levels without actually having to waste a lot of energy to swim up and down. So, the way this works is that when the bladder gets filled with gas, the fish will flow up into the water column, and if it gets emptied out, it will go down. Pretty interesting, right? A swim bladder structure consists of two gas-filled sacs, which is located in the dorsal portion of the fish itself. Some fish, as stated earlier, have different organ structures for the swim bladder and actually only have one gas-filled sac. Some fish even have what is called a physostomous swim bladder, which basically means that it can fill up the swim bladder by gulping air from the surface and then it can remove it again in a similar manner. Pretty cool, right? While fish has a lot of other organs, they do have similar organs to us, like the brain and the heart and the eyes and the liver and the intestines and the... Yeah. Can we go further along with this episode, please? So. When we are talking about zoology in our aquariums, one of the most important things is probably the ethology, or as most people would say, behavior. Behavior in aquatic animals are pretty important for us to understand and read their body language, as well as their health. By looking at fish, coral, amphibians and invertebrates and studying their behaviors, we can for example be able to detect diseases, infections or parasites. We can also study the way that fish will create a hierarchy in our aquariums, for example in an African cichlid tank. African cichlids are very intelligent fish and has developed a pegging order that is very visible in the wild and in our aquariums. All groups of African cichlids have an alpha male, which is the dominant male of the tank that is on the top of the pegging order, which essentially means that he can peg and bite on whoever he wants to. The other African cichlids, however, are quite different. If they somehow intimidate or challenge that alpha male, they'll get dealt with, and if it can't defend itself, well, it's gonna turn out pretty nasty for the poor little fish. One thing that is always brought to my attention with African cichlids is that they adapt in amazing ways to the pegging order. Some males that are in the bottom of this pegging order might actually disguise itself as a female by dimming down its bright colorations so they won't intimidate the alpha male in any way. 
Some African cichlids, however, go up for the challenge and begin to flash their beautiful colors and will start to make a fighting dance. This is where they'll start doing mouth fights and bizarre fighting methods. We can also look at fish fry, like guppy fry for example. What is really amazing about these little guys is that they always find a way to hide. Always. They'll do that most of the time and they'll school together in small shoals that make sure that they stay more safe from getting eaten by bigger predatory fish which might actually just be their mom and dad. So sad. If we look at saltwater fish, we'll be able to discover entirely different behaviors. Why? Well, because they come from a much bigger ecosystem, the ocean. They'll behave in strange ways like swim in different ways to match big currents and even hide in strange ways to make sure they won't get eaten by fish that might be bigger than you and me. And what is most fascinating about my reef tank is the coral. Coral seems as very simple animals, but actually they are very alien to us and we don't even completely understand them yet. What we do know is that they are classified as animals even though they are pretty much a plant, an animal and a rock at the same time. Stony corals create skeletons made of calcium carbonate which makes these beautiful structures and reef plateaus. And we can actually study behavior on these guys too, however it seems a lot more simple than you might think. The animal part of a coral is what is called polyps. Polyps is what sits outside on the tissue of the coral, which catches food from the currents. Polyps do react to different sorts of stress or health. If a polyp is healthy, you will most likely see some polyp extension, where the polyps will get really long and try to catch as much food as possible. Although there are some few exceptions of this rule, because some species operate in different ways. If a polyp is stressed, it will almost always retract which is a defensive mechanism that it uses to make sure it doesn't get way too vulnerable. It might also lose coloration. This is because it loses its succentelli, which is a symbiotic algae that grows on coral that gives them their photosynthetic growth rates. You might also see these fascinating coral creatures adapt in spectacular ways. They will for example create different shapes and sizes depending on where they stand in the current. For example, some coral rely a lot on eating plankton, so they will often create very dense shapes. This is essentially for catching a maximum amount of plankton in the water column. This is why I really enjoy keeping coral, because they are so fascinating animals. When we look at the ethology at many of these aquatic animals, it's really fascinating to see all of the amazing ways that these guys actually create territories. A lot of saltwater fish actually creates territories to make sure that they have a safe place to stay in the entire ocean. For example, my six line rest right here, normally being a very shy fish, actually has a very distinct territory in all of the caves in my tank. You can also see my blue devil damselfish right here, who actually defends this little cave that he dug in the sand. This way, he has a safe place to hide and a place to be alone and maybe breed with a female in the future. Although, he does defend this cave with his life. My clownfish are another great example. In the middle of my reef aquarium, there is located a rather large cave that is covered with Kenya trees. The clownfish apparently really likes this spot and defends it constantly. They also always eat here and will often just quickly swim into the open to catch some food and immediately dive back into the cave opening to eat. The reason for this behavior is probably because there is no sea anemones in this tank and they don't have any other place to keep their territories. These guys do get very territorial and they will actually chase other fish that will intimidate them in any way. As I said earlier in this episode, by researching some of the ethology of your fish, you'll be able to detect diseases, infections and parasites on the fish. It's actually very visible, but you have to know what to look for. First of all, there are so many different diseases and parasites out there, as well as fungal growth and a lot of other crap. One of the main things to look for on fish is white spots. White spots on fish is usually a disease called ick, which is an internal parasite that digs holes on the outside of the fish, hence the white spots name, and will slowly kill the fish from the inside. 
Although, this might also be velvet or many other diseases, but ick is the main one at this point. Another thing to look for is bloat. Even fish with bloated stomachs or even bloated eyes or gills are usually a sign of infections or parasites. An example would be Malawi bloat, which creates a nasty bloated stomach on the fish. It's also very important to look for swimming problems. This is very common and might relate to a swim bladder disease. As I explained earlier, the swim bladder has a very important function for the fish and if it just gets damaged a little bit by a parasite, that would usually go really bad. The fish will have a lot of trouble with controlling its buoyancy and will make weird swimming motions. Woo! And the last one, wounds. If your fish has wounds and is unhealthy, it will possibly get infected with a nasty infection. These are typically bacterial infections, but might also be fungal infections. Bacterial infections are pretty annoying and can sometimes get eradicated by making sure that the fish has a good immune system. By the way, the immune system of a fish? How does that even work? Well, this is actually pretty strange. Because fish rely a lot on a layer of mucus that is outside on their scales. This is actually almost like an outside sort of immune system. Of course, fish has an immune system like us too, but not nearly as strong. So if the fish doesn't get a proper diet, it might actually get trouble creating this thin layer of slimy mucus because it doesn't get the right vitamins to grow it. This is the reason I recommend to get some good fish foods that make sure that your fish gets the right amount of proteins, vitamins, minerals and etc. So that was this episode of Aquarium Science. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you guys will keep watching this series. Thank you guys for watching and see you guys in another video.